All right. Uh, welcome, everybody. Going to get started today. So I got back from US Championships some days ago. It was not a great tournament for me. I was way too tired to um, to show my best, but there were still some interesting games. And I'd like to uh, spend today going over what I thought was my most interesting game of the tournament, which was against Ray Robson. Uh, so... Let's get this show on the road. Uh, so, to so put this in perspective, this is round three. Um, round one, I I held pretty easily against Sevian with black. Uh, I was not thrilled to get an extra black. I'm now do something like eight whites in a row. Um, but uh, so anyhow, I made a relatively easy draw with Sevian with black. I was under a little pressure at some point, but it wasn't too bad. Then uh, in round two, it was a very frustrating round. I was playing with Bruzon and I got out prepared and just didn't get to do anything. Like he just, it was a, he made such an easy draw. I wasn't able to make anything with the white pieces and it just felt like I was playing endlessly black. So I was a little bit tilted coming into this game with Ray. And he was playing well. He was on plus one. He won round one against Naroditsky and was had seven in really bad shape in round two with the black pieces. So um, Ray was clearly playing pretty well and I was already frustrated with the tournament and I was playing black. So I decided to be a bit aggressive and normally against Ray, I, I'm not sure if Sicilian would be the first thing I would think of, but um, I decided to play Night Earth. And uh, after uh, Bishop B5 check came, I was like, well, there goes all my preparation. Uh, Cause um, well, I, uh, I had a lot of work to do in the main lines. So after Bishop B5 check, the game continued knight d7, a4, knight f6. This was all still vaguely preparation. Um, and let's start here. Uh, does anybody know what's going on in this position, what the current state of theory is, and um, and what the plans for each side should be here? The plan for black is to play d4 and win in the center. d4 is going to be hard to pull off. Do you mean d5? This was recommended by Wesley, so untrustable. So you want to make sure you know um, this stuff because you know, a pretty good player recommended it. So Wesley came up with a very interesting plan for white. Uh, so Rio is saying there's a line that goes D3 and knight takes B6, yeah. So in my preparation for, I, I didn't review this before the game. I was just going off memory. And what I remembered was uh, that you weren't necessarily sh black's going to have to play b5 if you don't if you play knight b8 usually e5 hurts because uh, this would be the other way to, like you have to regroup your pieces somehow and this is one way to try so that you can play for bishop g4 and then hit the a5 pawn but usually knight b8 gets hit by e5 in a way that black won't enjoy so that was one thing uh but i was aware that when we play b5 of course white is going to play hx b6 and then depending on how white puts his pieces we're not exactly sure where which piece to take back with so for example the line that i had in my preparation which i hadn't reviewed and didn't remember was rookie one and then there's a line that goes b5 a takes b6 and black has i think quite a clever move here what should he play yeah everyone's saying bishop b7 i really like this i think this is um a good decision. You force White to make up his mind. If he plays d3, he's obviously giving up on playing d4. Um, and if he plays bishop f1, that's sort of advertising pretty heavily that he wants to play d4 later, and you can tailor your decisions uh, based around that. So, for example, after d3, I knew that Wesley gave this plan of bringing the queen to h4 like so, and then playing for bishop h6. And against this plan, I believe Black's best option is to play knight takes b6, and then after queen d2, I think e5 is okay. And um, or um, here, I think there's well, there's some line like a5, and you gain space with bishop c6 and a4, which makes it hard for White to clamp down on the queen side. And after something like queen g5. I think there's a line here that goes like a4, queen h4, e5, and then knight fd7. And in my opinion, black is fine here. Uh, the tactics work in his favor. Um, so, uh, yeah, if knight g5, I believe this is good, I think is the point. But um, anyhow, I, I vaguely remembered some stuff like that. 
Uh, but I thought that it was very clever to play bishop b7 first because after something like rook e1, b5 takes bishop b7, if he plays bishop f1, then here I'm not convinced I want to take on b6 with uh, with the knight. It might make more sense to take with the queen. Um, so uh, this is just sort of food for thought. Anyhow, what Ray did was he played d3. And this is not a bad move at all. In fact, I believe it's probably the best move. Um, but there was a little strategic idea here that I failed to appreciate during the game. So b5 is natural enough. But after a takes b6, what should we play now? This is very important. Yeah, Alexander Wang, that's correct. Do you want to share with us why this is such an important move? All right, so let me call on you. Participants, Alexander Wang. Uh, uh, so if you guys thought since Y played D3, it, he wouldn't play like D4 next move because that would just waste the tempo. But if you played Bishop B7, he's not going to try and play D4, so he probably wouldn't do anything. And I also wanted to play here D5, so I thought Knight B6 was pretty good. So there's a few reasons for knight b6, but I think the biggest one by far has to do with this pawn. Uh, and furthermore, the b2 pawn. What black really wants to do is get this pawn up to a4. If he can do that, he will gain enough space on the queen side that this pawn can no longer really be considered a weakness. And furthermore, white will not be able to just play b3 and bolster himself. Because at the moment, black has this weak Isolani on a6. Now, it can't be taken, but it's annoying to defend in the long run, and it can cause problems later on. While white, if he's able to just sort of play b3 and be solid, will have no weaknesses at all. We absolutely need to get this pawn forward. Now, once we've got the pawn to the a5 square, it should be very easy to get the pawn to a4. That will not take any particular effort. But getting it to a5 is the important thing in the first place. So I played bishop b7, and this was a serious mistake. How can white take advantage of this move? Um, I said knight to d2 because I'm planning to go to b3 to stop the a5 push. Yeah. So the problem for black here is that he's not in time to play a5 because if he plays knight takes b6, there comes knight b3. And this is how the game went. And uh, here I'm not able to play a5 and he will occupy the a5 square next uh, with his knight and I can't stop it. But the problem is if I take with the queen instead, of course, after knight b3, a5 here, even this probably isn't great, like some knight a4, bishop d2 could be an issue. Uh, but knight c4 is much more to the point. And again, he will occupy the a5 square. And once this pawn is fixed on a6, uh, white will be able to consolidate with b3 later, and the position can get very bad very fast. So after knight b6, we're going to take this from black's point of view again. I was hit with some preparation, and once he played knight d2, I had already realized I screwed up. And here I think black's already actually quite a bit worse, like not just a little worse, like clearly worse. So there came knight b6, knight b3, uh, queen c7, and knight a5. And here I think I really made a bad decision. And I'm hoping y'all can do better. Uh, what should black play and why? I think it's almost only move territory already. And think carefully. Please give me a reason for making a move. If you give me a, a move that makes no sense and you have no reason behind it, that's not very helpful. I didn't yet appreciate how bad the situation was. So a couple of people have given me D5, which I think is just not what we want to be doing. You're going to leave yourself with two isolated pawns on the queen side and the bishop on b7 is going to drop. Uh, Austin says knight c8 to a7. It's closer. But after knight c8, I think we can take this on e5 as bad news. Um, in fact, this is very bad news. So let's not do that. Um, yeah, Sepahur, that's correct. Why don't I call on you? Um. So, um, I thought the, the move should be knight d7. Which one? Um, f. Yeah. I like this move, knight f d7. Why do you want it? Because I want to play knight b a knight c6 and eliminate the knight on a5. Probably and knight e5 to, to c6 looks more yeah. active, but... Okay, yeah. 
Yeah, I think we absolutely need to get rid of this knight on a5. That's it's just that's the piece that's stopping all of our counterplay. And there's no doubt black is still worse here. Um, maybe even clearly worse. But if we he's white is not able to stop this knight from reaching c6, and then we start playing. Like I think the computer offered some line bishop e3, knight e5, and it said now the only move like to get a clear edge for white is d4, and something like this. The computer says white's clearly better here. I think it found the idea to play knight d5, if I'm not mistaken, and somehow this tactically works. Like, if we take this way, we cannot take on d5 or c2. And if we take this way, again, we cannot take on d5 or c2. And But this is not easy for white, and it's actually at least got our pieces onto active squares. And black's worse for sure, but he's not dead. Anyhow, I, was, I played bishop c8, but... The funny thing is, I I think even if white just got to move again, I don't believe he would be taking this bishop. I think the knight's probably a better piece. Just controlling this a pawn is so nasty. So after bishop c8, bishop g5, I started thinking here, and I basically concluded my position's already almost hopeless. I mean, white's play is incredibly straightforward. He's going to go queen d2 and b3 to keep everything nice and solid. At some point, he can start throwing f4, f5 at me. And basically, I will have no counterplay ever, and uh, I'm eventually going to get sort of made it on the king side. And I just sort of didn't really see much I could do about it either, uh, since if I ever bring my bishop to e6, it will just walk into f4, f5 even harder, and I couldn't find anything sensible to play. Um, so... After a long thought, I played e5, which does not solve my problems in the slightest. I think black still basically lost. But I think in practice, it was a reasonable decision because at least now I can stick my bishop on e6 without getting it rolled over. And I'm always very happy to see white play f4 because then after e takes f4 and some knight comes to d7 and I have the long diagonal in the e5 square, we actually get to play. So here you guys get to play the white pieces. Now, what Ray did was not a bad move at all. In fact, I think it was the computer's first choice. But there was a move during the game that I saw that scared me a lot more. And I was very happy to see what Ray actually played. So let's see what, um, let's see what you guys can come up with for white here. So people are giving me knight c4. This one, I mean, I'm sure white's clearly better, but I wasn't so scared of it. Like let's say we go bishop e6 and challenge this knight and fight for the d5 square. Um, but yeah, Roger has a good point. Roger, you wanna share with us? So I decided that I wanted to trade both my bishops for the bishop and knight. So now after now after e either you play knight d7, which basically runs into knight d5 losing material, uh, and the other choice is to take, and it really feels like black is positionally lost. Uh, there's no counterplay, and the bishop is stuck to its own color, which means it can't get out. And and then on top of that, white might have some idea of knight c4 and knight d5. Okay. Um, yeah, so basically here, it's similar to this idea of, of playing knight c4, except here after bishop e6, I think black is in much better shape to fight back for the key squares. Like, you cannot take this one and go bishop g4 now as easily because you're hanging on c4. Um so I really like this idea to just trade these guys, play bishop g4, and try to simplify this position down to good knight versus bad bishop. So a couple of people are asking about bishop e6, which is definitely a thought, and it might it's probably what I would have had to play, but I think during the game, actually, I wanted to play bishop b7 instead, which is a very sad move, but because I have, like, no counter... No counterplay, no nothing, but at least I'm not completely murdered on d5. But the problem is here, I think the cure is worse than the disease. Like, let's say we take this one and go... Maybe start with knight c4. Um, if you ever take this guy and we get a situation like this, I think black can basically resign and go queen d3, rook a4, rook a1, d3, no counterplay whatsoever. And sooner or later, this a pawn should just drop. Uh, and this bishop is incredibly bad. And if you don't take it, the question is, what do you do? Because you can't play d5 yet. Um, if you want to prepare it, you cannot bring this rook to the rook on a to d8 because if rook takes a6, if rook fd8, we can go queen g4, and now it's incredibly annoying to defend the e6 pawn. And the whole position just sort of feels like it's collapsing very, very quickly for black. Um, and furthermore, rook a3, rook fa1 comes incredibly quickly. And so 
I think this position during the this felt like so horrible for Black to me during the game. I thought I was basically lost. I mean, I was gonna play Bishop B7, which is the best move, but this as well, like I mean, you know, this whole bishop b7 back to c8, back to b7, like where it still does nothing is really not a very inspiring way to play chess. And I think in a higher chess sense, black should be basically lost here. Um so that's the move that scared me the most. Uh, Ray played queen d2, which I was very happy to see. And it's funny because the computer says it's best and it still says I'm basically busted. But at least here I was able to play um, to play bishop e6. So uh, there came bishop f3 to, uh, to, stop, um, to stop black from playing d5. And still this position, I, I felt like it had improved, but it, it's incredibly bad. But I really liked the plan that I came up with here in the next couple of moves. Uh, and I, I'd like you guys to try to figure out how Black should proceed. I think there's a way that I can... I'm still lost, but I, I think there's definitely a best way to organize the pieces that gives Black the maximum hope to fight back. And this is the part of the game where I finally started to play a little bit like myself. Guys, focus on the chest, not, not on what random messages people are posting. All right, so one way to think about this, guys, is the move bishop f3 from white is basically saying, I'm not going to kill you anytime soon. I just want to stop you from playing d5, and I want to contain your counterplay. And white's plan to win this game is probably something along the lines of, I don't know, b3, rook a3, rook a1, knight c4. It's going to work. Like, you will eventually lose this game on the queen side. Uh, but you're, um, but you will, uh, it takes some time. And so basically the move Bishop 3 says, I'm killing your counterplay. I don't care what you have in the next few moves. Eventually you're going to lose this game. What we need to do is find counterplay. So Rio, that's the wrong idea, but I think it's it's getting in the right direction. So you don't want to share with us what you had in mind? Let me, let me talk to Rio. So I'll find Rio here. Okay, so um, I want to play KHA and then next move follow up on IG8 and okay, maybe move the rook out of the way. And then followed by some F5 for counterplay. And H H6 is possible because the knight on G8 can support H6. Yeah. So we got our King's Indian player in the house. Get this knight out of the way and then play F5, right? Makes perfect sense. That's how we get counterplay. But on a scale of one to checkmate, how dangerous is F5? I don't really think it's going to do anything that horrible to white right away. And furthermore, when we play F5, this diagonal is going to be open. So in order to get F5 through, we are going to need to move this rook off of A8. What square is the best square for the rook? Anybody can answer. A7, does that look like a happy square or a sad square? A lot of people are saying B8, but white's going to play B3. E8, probably. Okay, Rio, it's good. We can turn your mic back off. But yeah, I think e8 is the best square for this rook. Now, what we're thinking is when we play a move like rook e8, who are we abandoning when this happens? What was that rook doing before? Yeah, so we're all seeing that a6 is going to be loose. When we play rook a8, we're, we're going to be loose. This pawn's going to be loose. And white's whole plan was to play something like b3, knight c4 in the first place to attack a6. So what Rio was suggesting was king h8, knight g8. Now that's, first of all, it's a tempo spent on king h8, which does not immediately get the knight out of the way. But second of all, let's imagine we play rook a8. Where does that knight actually belong? The knight on f6. If we could reroute it somewhere, what do we want to do with it? Austin says c6, sure. But I think on the way to c6, where do we have to go instead? Yeah, super saying. B8, yeah. So basically, I think this move knight FD7 is very clever. And the point is, what I want to do is set up with uh, rook A8, and then I'm ready for F5. Now, F5 is not the end of the world for white by any stretch, but at least something for him to think about and at some level of counterplay. And basically, if white plays something like B3, as he did in the game, first of all, when I bring my knight back to B8, uh, it's nice that if white ever plays something like knight D5, that a knight on B8 can fight for the C6 square. But more importantly, when white plays knight C4, if I play f5 here, I think I'm just going to lose this race and I'm going to lose it by a lot. I don't think it's even close. Like white is going to crush the queen side in like two more moves. Knight b5 is coming next. Like I'm about to completely collapse. I cannot give this pawn. So here we can go knight b8. And basically what my contention was here is I have one bad piece, the knight on b8. It's a really bad piece. It's performing a strictly passive role and not really doing much of anything else. Uh, but that's it. 
And then white doesn't have a great way to crash through to this pawn on a6. And it's very important that I got my rook out of the way from a8 first. So basically I'm saying one bad piece defending a6, stopping white's play. That bad piece has the potential to go to c6 and d4 later. Now, again, we're not ready to do it right now, but that could become a thing later on. And now also I'm ready to play f5. And it's not that easy for white to break through. And around here, I think the computer still says I'm basically lost but I was feeling a lot better about my position and that I was actually organizing my pieces and get, getting some kind of practical chances. So um, Ray's next move was not terrible, but it wasn't a very scary one either. So he played H3. Now, this is not a move that makes me immediately fear that my queen side is going to collapse. So uh, it gets me to think, what do I want to play next? Um, and here I was very happy with the decision I came I came up with. So uh, what should black play and why? Austin says F5 is the plan, but there's a question. Should we be playing F5 now or do we want to prepare for it with something else? A good question is how much time do we have? H3 is such a scary move that we think we need to make the counterplay right away, or do we need to, or is there a way we can improve our position first? So Eric says F6 first, and then Rook F7, Rook E F8. I don't love that. First of all, I actually think this bishop on G5 is sort of misplaced because if we're able to go F5, F and F4, that bishop gets trapped. So that means that after F5, White's going to have to do something or else he's going to lose a piece. So first of all, I think, after, and furthermore, after F6 and bishop E3, that pin can be very annoying when White goes knight takes B6 and looks for um, and looks for B4 next. So Austin says, what preparing moves do we need? The rooks are already behind the pawn so we can go for it. But the question is, are the rooks actually going to be that well placed? Like, after, first of all, after F5, what do we think White's going to play in response? That's a good place to start. Rio says EF. Yeah, I think that's sort of what he has to do. So let's say this game goes F5, E takes F5. Uh, every Russian schoolboy knows you take back on F5 with the pawn, and now what happens? White has an annoying move. Knight e3, knight d5, I think that's asking a bit too much. But I think just taking this one and then knight d5, as Eric has said, this queen is now extremely bad. Uh, she doesn't have a great score to go to. Um, one major issue is that if we play something like queen b7 or queen c6, is that uh, this knight move comes with check. If we could meet knight f6 with e4, like the position will blow up and who knows what's happening. That doesn't seem so bad. Um, or at least it's something we could sort of consider. Furthermore, another thing is what's our actual plan to make more counterplay against white's king? What is the open file that we want to use? People are getting this, the G file. So I really think it's actually very helpful to start with the move king h8 because if White's playing h3, that's sort of telling me he's not really sure how to actually execute on the queen side or what the plan should be. And once I have played king h8, now when I play f5, uh, a few things have changed. Um, so one is that after f5, e takes f5 and g f5, knight b6, queen b6, my queen can in theory step onto this long diagonal in some cases. Um, another thing that's happened is that if we go f5, they take everything, and then knight d5. If I take it, bishop takes d5 is not check, which means I will have time to play f4 and lock in black's, white's bishop on g5, which could be an issue. And finally, it means that the g file is going to open. So it feels like king h8 is a very useful move uh, if black wants to play f5. Now, I get it. If white had in this position gone rook fb1 or something and said made a not so subtle idea of taking on b6 and playing b4 or something like super direct, maybe we would want to be more to the point. But h3 is not a move that screams, oh my God, we have to do f5 right now. And I think there's a good that king h8 is a good way to prepare for hostilities later on. And indeed, after king h8, Ray played bishop g4. Now, what is this move actually just straight up begging for? Yeah, I mean, I don't even, I took like a minute to play f5. I don't even know why I took that long. Now, 
like if you compare this to what would have happened if we had played F5 on the previous move, this is obviously a huge improvement that will work tremendously in Black's favor. So the game continued, E takes F5, G takes F5. And, you know, chess, like, if you get it, if you get outplayed in the opener and you make a dumb decision like I did, even if you're playing a really good game after that, which I think I was, you're still going to have a bad position. There's no doubt black is still clearly worse here. But I was fighting back reasonably hard. So there came Bishop H5. Next decision. We're saving this rook. Are we play or we should save this rook, I think. I briefly considered playing D5 to get a massive center, but the problem is here... Um, and the move bishop h6 annoyed me too much. Um, and I, I don't really think... I, I did consider it, but I don't think this is great. So we have to save this rook, and we have to make a choice. Do we play bishop f7, or do we play rook c8? We're saying rook c8, bishop is too important. Why is the bishop so important? And furthermore, what do we expect white's next move to be? What is white going to play next? That's a good question to ask yourself before deciding between bishop f7 and rook c8. Uh, I said the bishop on h5 is controlling the f7 and the e8 squares, but the black bishop on e6 is just kind of hitting that knight on c4, uh, and that doesn't really do anything. And it's also blocked by the pawn on f5, so I thought that if we trade the bishops, then trading one of our bad pieces for one of white's good ones. So there's a lot of reasons that Bishop F7 is the best move, but I'll highlight a few. One is I think it's not a great piece. It's sort of in the way. Two, I think White's next move is very likely F4. He doesn't want to let Black play F4, gain all the space, and maroon the Bishop on G5, where it will be in danger of being lost. So given that White is playing F4, we're going to anticipate that the E file is going to potentially open. So having a Rook on the E file is nice. And furthermore, after Bishop F7, once we have traded these guys, it's pretty clear we wanted to use the G-file. Now we are closer to bringing both rooks to the G-file as opposed to just one, because we have lifted a rook up to the seventh rank. So I think this gives Black a lot more potential for counterplay than he would have if he were to play something like rook c8, when after f4, the position is really bad. So there came bishop f7, take, take, and f4. What are we going to do? Okay, so e takes f4, bishop d4, and rook g8, rook f g7. That's fine, but it it's assuming white's not going to get to make moves either. Like after e f4, bishop takes f4. Like you're getting smashed on d6. I don't think you want to give that pawn. And if you take on c4, you will open the d file, and white will have knight d5 available. This is not like I don't think it's nearly as simple as that. So. Okay, so Austin has an interesting one. E4, D, E4, Bishop, D4, check. King, H1, F takes E4. White cannot stop D5. For example, Knight, E3, Queen, C6. I don't believe this for half a second. So let's say I go Rook, A, E1. This looks absolutely gone. I think you D5, but can't I take and then take this one, D5 next? So like after rook a e1, this e4 pawn is hanging. If queen c6, we can take on c take on b6 and take on e4. And if you do something like this, like I don't know, you can play e3, but okay, knight d5 and c3 is coming. You're going to lose this pawn and you're going to lose the game. I don't think there's any ifs, ands, or buts about that. So yeah, I did consider playing e4 directly here. I don't know why we felt the need to include bishop d4 check, but basically this position I thought was really bad. Um and yeah, computer agreed. So I don't like e4. Uh, we need to figure out how to make more counterplay. E takes f4 is the right idea to open the g file, but I think it's the wrong moment for it. We can prepare for it accordingly. So what are we going to do? So Roger has this right. Yeah, I like um, I like playing rook g8 first. I think it makes a lot of sense to get this rook on the g file in advance, uh, which is clearly where it belongs. Um, like white's about to go rook a e1, and he's going to contest the e file. We want this rook on the g file. We want it there already. And if white wants to change the structure with f takes e5, if we get a position like this one, this is not easy at all. I mean, I think the computer says white's much better here, but this looks totally unclear to me after, I don't know, take and take. Black's ready for f4 next when that bishop on this bishop is going to get hit. And then if it moves away, there's rook g7 stuff. I think computer said white's much better here, but it, I'm not sure I'm convinced by it. So um, after rook g8, Ray played uh, king h1. 
stepping out of the way of uh, Bishop D4 coming with tempo, for example. And here again, I was very happy with the decision I, I came up with. What should Black play and why? You want to be at least a little bit patient, I think. Bishop F6 has been called, but I think then Bishop... Okay, guys, Bishop F6, got to be careful. White's going to take this and take, and then Knight D5. And if D5 is well, we're going to take B6 and go Knight D5. So we should be at least a little bit careful. This is a strategic decision, not a tactical one. It's not the time to strike yet. We need to figure out how to build up our position better. So I said h6, and then e takes f4, so then white can't take back to the bishop, and then d6 isn't weak? Yeah. So h6, e takes f4 makes a lot of sense, because uh, white will have a harder time taking back with one of with the bishop, which you'd really like to take back with to harass d6 and keep the position under control. But again, I think this is a little bit rushed. And when we play h6, uh, this h6 pawn can become an issue. So for example, after takes... Um, if white plays like rook takes a four, uh, okay, there's a tactical resource here that doesn't work. What is it and why doesn't it work? Eric, you want to share with us? That's a good idea. Yeah, okay. We just got it right. We want to take this knight and go queen c3, knight d5 with a fork, but queen c3 is check. And furthermore, when we play h6, this h6 pawn can randomly be hanging in a lot of variations. So I really like playing king h7. It means that when we play e takes f4 later, our king is now going to be on a totally safe square where h6 is not hanging, where queen takes c3 is not check. And at some point, if we start going e takes f4, bishop takes c3, rook fg7, now we're really talking about counterplay. But it's very nice to be able to play king h7 first because queen takes c3 doesn't come with check. And furthermore here, it's hard to see what White's next move is because the piece I think he'd really like to get him to play is this rook. But if he ever touches that guy, I might just say, okay, psych, my next move is knight c6. Get this, my one bad piece back into the game as soon as a6 isn't hanging. And I think White's position is not so easy here. So for example, Ray played rook f2, which seemed like a natural enough move. And now of course it's time for e takes f4. And if rook takes f4, we're ready with bishop takes c3. Uh, queen takes c3 and knight d5. And to Austin saying is white still better? No, he is not. Now black is very much fine. So um, after e takes f4, actually during the game, I thought I was better here. Now, this is a pretty normal feeling to get. Like if you just have a really horrible position for like an entire game and then you outplay your opponent for a while and the, the trend is clearly going in your direction, at some point, like when the position is equal, you feel like you're better. That's just normal. I mean, okay, if it's obviously dead equal, it's one thing. But here, this is about balance, but it's dynamic and balanced. During the game, I believed I was better. Like there was some, um, there was some trickery here. Like I think uh, Ray told me after the game he was planning something like this, but didn't realize that. I think it's Queen B7 now, where he doesn't have a good move. Um, there's just too much hanging stuff. And uh, he cannot take on f4. I'm ready for like bishop d4 next, or even just bishop e5 and rook g7. And this is bad news for white. So Ray thought for a long time here and found the best move, which was rook e1. And here I made a boo boo oversight. Now, luckily, it didn't cost me the game, uh, but I thought I was doing really well and I missed a key resource. So uh, what should black play here and why? Be smarter than me. Eric, I don't love that. I really don't like giving white the d5 square like that. Yeah, so Austin's got this reasonably right. So, yeah, I think it's good to get rid of this knight. Our bishop looked nice, but it wasn't really doing anything. And now we go knight d5. And Ray told me after the game he wanted to play queen a1 to freeze the knight and b8 in place, which is the best move. And here, this is just an unclear position. I think the computer at high depths calls it equal. But uh, it's just a mess. Like, for example, there's some line now that goes knight c6, rook e6, here takes and rook d7. And, um, and like, strategically, black's obviously in massive trouble, but he's getting a lot of counterplay against white's king really quickly. Like, if white has to take this one and we're ready for F f3 and then f4, like, this is, you know, this is counterplay. Computer calls it equal, but the game goes on. Anyhow, I played bishop d4, which felt like a very natural move at the time. Uh, be, but uh, Ray quickly pointed out what was wrong with it. So let's see if you guys can figure out what white should play here and why. 
Okay, so Eric, that's just a much worse version of the line we just covered because when knight c6 to d, yeah, so like if rook f3, we can just take this, if nothing else. And even if we just play the exact same variation, knight d4 is going to be a tempo and g2 is hanging in a way that it wasn't before. So this is just a bad version of the same line. There's a much better uh, way for white. So here I wanted to play knight takes b6. If mm -hmm. you can play knight takes b6, then you would get the d5 square. Mm -hmm. So I think the challenging variation is bishop takes f2, queen takes f2, knight queen takes b6, and then knight d5. And then you can at least play knight f6 next move. Yeah, you get your exchange back. Um, and here actually it turns out black is dead lost. Because uh, I had seen this line and I thought I'm going... Um, Queen c6 with a reasonable position, but uh, you're actually going to do even e7 instead. And here I think I'm basically just resigning. You lose this rook on g8, and then you have no counterplay in the g file. Queen takes f4 comes, and all of your pawns are horribly split, and the king is open, and material is equal. It's just bad news. Uh, so that's basically lost. Uh, what I had missed was that this knight d5 move was so powerful. So I had to play queen takes b6, and now this is just not particularly nice anymore. So Ray uh, played knight d5, which was quite fine. And then after queen b7, I was expecting him to play knight takes f4, but he played c4 and sacrificed the exchange this way. And um, this position is now very messy. Uh, I think the computer actually said I'm not even supposed to take this rook, which I was a little bit surprised by. Uh, but I took it. And here there's a couple ways for black. I mean... Rook e6 in knight f6, there's a lot of very scary moves coming, uh, but I chose the most active way possible, which was to start with um, with knight c6. So if rook e6, I believe my point here was I can go knight d4, takes, and f3, and then I think my attack is stronger than white's. If he plays, for example, g takes f3, I go queen b3, and I feel like white's probably going to get mated. Um so Ray went ahead and took the exchange back like so, take, take, and now, um, but after rook g6 to kick the bishop away from the e7 square, and then knight d4. Uh, here I thought I was okay. I'm a pawn out for the moment. I'm obviously not going to hang on to it, but I thought I was going to be able to tear open white's king a little bit. But it's actually not that easy. There came king h2. And now uh, black has to be extremely precise to hang on here. So... The game continued rook g3, rook e6. Black now has to find a few only moves in a row to hang on. So let's see what you guys can come up with. What should we do? Rook e3. Yeah, so rook e3 has been called, but of course, um, but of course, you have to be ready for rook takes d6 there, not rook takes e3. White's well, not going to give you a free pass pawn like that. All right, rook g6, take, take, maybe a draw, I doubt it, but. All right, so let's see what people have come up with. So queen g7 has been called. Rook takes d6, queen e5, and I don't get it. After queen takes d4, I think we resign. Um, other moves, queen c6 from Kelsey Liu. Here, the move that bothered me was actually c5, because after queen takes c5, we're no longer threatening g2, which means that following check and check, here h4, we're not mated, and here white wins, I think. So that was bothersome. Um, I think b4 is also just good. Uh, but rook g6 has been called and saying that maybe this is a draw from the a pawn, but I don't think so. Like, we take this one, and then... Take this one, take this one. I think we're taking too much stuff. Uh, maybe it's, eh, I don't know. Even here, like, even if we just start running the C-pawn, like, white should win this race. The C-pawn is a lot more f further advanced than the A-pawn. Uh, so, but I think somebody uh, got this right. Uh, am I sure about queen C6, Rio? Which line? I mean, I think both B4 and, I was worried about C5, but I believe both B4 and C5 probably win. Uh, what's the move after c5? I think this is gone. Queen takes c5, take and take. I think this is winning for white. Rook g5 and oh, and queen e5 at the end is your point. Yeah, maybe this is a move. 
Let's see, King, King G6. Yeah, maybe this is still a draw. But let's maybe B4 is the way. Uh, this is probably stronger. Like, Black just doesn't have a move now, and C5 is coming. Uh, so, it's Queen D7 now. You could have played Queen D7 last week. Okay, now I'm going to take this one. Now, no more nonsense. Now, this one is getting taken. Uh, so, um, yeah, here a couple of people have got this. Uh, so, Kevin, so you want to share with us? Uh, so basically, my idea was uh, rook e3, rook takes d6, and then f3. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And so, how did you expect the game to proceed now? Um, he could take, but that's just bad because, like, you have like queen c7 or queen e7, queen c7, queen somewhere intelligent. Yeah. I think actually queen e yeah, it's queen c7, queen g3, rook e2, check rook e6, and black wins. So, yeah. Basically, here, this is the whole point. Whenever you get major piece positions, like with no minors, whoever's king is more open is at a huge disadvantage. And this is something that Magnus told me a long time ago about this. I think I even did a session here at US Chess School about it with um, about a game between Ding and Geary where uh, where Geary's had played like, you know, g6, f5, e4, but his king was totally safe and there were a lot of pieces on the board. And basically what Magnus had told me is whenever one side has opened the area around their king by moving up their pawns, uh, the best thing the other side can do is just trade off all of the minor pieces and only leave the heavies. And here we have a pure heavy piece position. We absolutely need to tear open white's king cover. And here I think black is getting full counterplay. Uh, Ray found queen g3, which... It's not quite only move, but I mean, it's not crazy difficult, but like, I think white's position is quite tough, actually, if he doesn't find this. Um, so yeah, the game went queen g3, queen g7, and then after take and take, if rook takes d4, I can play something like, for example, I calculate a line f2, rook f4, take, takes, takes, and um, I don't know, say something like this. We'll get this on game, but it's obviously a very routine draw. I mean, nominally he has the extra pawn, but I'm never going to lose. So Ray pushed it a little bit harder. He um, he took on F3, which was the best move to keep this pawn alive and run up with the king, but it wasn't too hard. So I took B3, Rook D4, A5. Yeah, so here when I played A5, I understood that um, I'm going to get to a two versus one. Like, for example, if he plays Rook D5, he wins a pawn. Like, he can certainly do this whenever he wants it. But this is a draw. I'm like, I'm like ninety percent sure, maybe even ninety five percent sure. I would draw this without H pawns. I know it's a technical draw. It's a little bit annoying to defend, but I'm pretty sure I would draw it without H pawns. With an H pawn, like with with an H pawn, like so, it's only one pawn down. I'm basically a hundred. So, uh, but I thought this was clever because I was worried that if I try to like keep all my pawns with rook c3, this king can come pretty fast. And then once the king comes to d6 and he plays c5, I'm I'm quite worried for my safety. So I, I think that's still a draw as well. But after a5, this was just easy. I um I quickly understood that I got this position and then uh yeah I made a draw. There wasn't much more to see here. So um okay interesting game uh i definitely think this was the most interesting game i played at the u.s championship in terms of the dynamism complicated moments difficult decision making practical choices in terms of reorganizing the pieces looking for counterplay in a bad position uh oh yeah the game with Carwano was interesting too that one as well uh the the four game the four decisive games were all pretty boring actually the ones i played but um 